We all know it. Walked it every day. But none of them were like these. The world's most dangerous ways to school. Climbing, freezing, paddling for hours, all for the chance of a better life. Risky, spectacular, and sometimes simply beautiful. The world's most dangerous ways to school. Siberia, endless vastness, Arctic temperatures, even further east than Japan and 5,000 kilometers north of Vladivostok lies Yakutia, Russia's coldest republic. In the midst of it, Omyakon. With 500 residents, it is the coldest inhabited place on Earth. The average temperature in winter, minus 40 degrees Celsius. Here, everything ordinary becomes something special. Also, and especially, the way to school. A daily adventure trip in hostile temperatures. The children of the Siberian Onyakon have the world's coldest way to school. Six a.m. An ice cold morning in Omyakon. Irina Tarik is preparing for when her children get up. She melts the ice from the river so her son Alyosha can wash the sleep out of his eyes. There is no running water at the coldest place on Earth. Temperatures can reach as low as minus 70 degrees Celsius. Water pipes would quite simply freeze. So the residents fetch their fresh water from the river in blocks of ice and then melt it for use. Afterwards, Irina checks the temperature, as she does every day around minus 50 degrees again. That means her son Alyosha must go to school. Alyosha is eight years old. The children of his age group are only excused from attending school when the temperatures dip below minus 54 degrees. Even before his departure for school, Alyosha feels the grim cold. With no running water, the house also has no toilet, so Alyosha already has to go outside to the outhouse in the garden. Sometimes, I wouldn't mind staying inside the house because I'm only able to take staying outside for an hour at most, or maybe two. His mother Irina has heated up the living room to about 20 degrees. So when Alyosha opens the door to the outer room and afterwards the actual front door, it is essentially 70 degrees colder. Everyday life in Omyakon. In Omyakon, no one spends more time than necessary out in the cold. Everything that happens outside is done very efficiently. Otherwise, it not only becomes unpleasant, but also dangerous. The little Yakut rushes back into the house as fast as he can. Seven kilometers away, on a remote farm, Alyosha's classmate Sayana is up too. The family lives from their cows. Before going to school, Sayana must help in the stable. It's relatively warm there, with temperatures around freezing. 
In Oymyakon too, they say, work is the best clothing. Sayana, will you please bring the bucket and the stool? Mom, when I'm older, I will help you milk even more cows, okay? During the severe winters, the family needs every helping hand in the stable. The elder siblings pitch in and help with the feeding and tending of the animals. The family could well imagine Sayana taking over the farm one day, but in truth, they've known for a long time that school is the key to their youngest daughter's dreams. I like animals, not only cows, but also dogs and cats. That's why you'd prefer to become a vet, right? Oh, yes. Anyone who wants to become a vet must go to school. And whoever wants to go to school and lives outside the village is dependent on Grigori. Grigori is the driver of the school bus, the only one in Oymyakon. The school supplied the 58-year-old with a heated garage. This luxury guarantees that the engine fluids of the bus are protected from freezing and that his vehicle starts in these icy temperatures. Today it is very cold again. I have to check the oil and the gearbox every morning. It's already below minus 50 degrees. Well, that's normal. So what? That's how I do it every day. After all, it's for the sake of the children's lives. In order for the bus to be able to drive in these extreme temperatures in the first place, Grigori has taken special precautions for the bus. Engine failure with children on board would be very dangerous. Therefore, the 58-year-old uses blankets as insulation for all the damageable, sensitive cables. This is supposed to protect the bus against the extreme cold during nine long winter months. Grigori keeps warm by listening to the radio, turned up loudly. Indeed, all the time. Some of the students are bugged by Grigori's loud radio, but there is no way to avoid it. The children living on the farms outside the village are dependent on the bus driver. Most households have no car of their own. Back to Alyosha. After half an hour on the stove, the water from the river is warm enough for the daily spit bath. In the Yakushin part of Siberia, there are almost no jobs. Without a school leaving certificate, the chances of finding a good job are poor. Alyosha's mother knows this. That's why she sends her children to school. Only her youngest son may stay at home today. The kindergarten remains closed at temperatures below minus 48 degrees Celsius.
On her parents' farm, seven kilometers away from Oymyakon, Sayana's and her family's work in the stable is now done. Breakfast. There's fish, eggs, and warm porridge made of bread, milk, and sugar. A warm, high-energy meal. Sayana has older siblings who will soon have to catch the bus to school as well. Hurry up with your breakfast. Make sure you don't miss that bus. The family's farm is so remote that the school bus cannot pick up Sayana and her brothers directly. The three of them still have to walk quite a ways through the icy cold. Their mother, Shigina, wraps her daughter in four different layers of clothes, on top of which she wears another two jackets. as well as two pairs of gloves, a cap, and a thick hood. Often Sayana wears so many clothes that she is unable to dress or undress by herself. The student Alyosha should also make no mistake when dressing for his way to school and relies on the layering method as well. Like the other children in Oymyakon, the eight-year-old has a special outfit solely for school. Over his sweater, Alyosha is wearing a shirt and a jacket. He also wears six layers of clothing, including the warm jacket made of wool and fur. His mother, Irina, covers every exposed inch of his skin. In Onyekon, frostbite is not uncommon. Alyosha walks quickly when he is on his way. Only for a short moment, a very special one, does he take his time. He hears his nasal mucous membrane crackle as it freezes in his sinuses within split seconds. The moisture immediately forms little icicles on his eyelashes. High time to get going on his way to school, which is about one kilometer long. A worried mother stays behind. We only survive here because we're used to it. But below 55, 56 degrees, I don't let them leave the house. Around minus 60, it's too dangerous. We then don't go out at all. Today, it is three degrees warmer than Irina's limit of minus 55 degrees. Much to Alyosha's delight, because he doesn't like the days where he is not allowed out at all. In spite of the cold, Alyosha really likes his way to school. I like my way to school because it's on foot. Running is great fun. Hati! Toda. Alyosha likes to dawdle and sometimes even makes a few detours, despite his parents' strict instructions. Meanwhile, the school bus still struggles along the ramshackle streets of Yakutia. Grigori needs to pick up nearly 50 children today and take them to school. Once Grigori fell ill, more than a third of the students missed class. If the bus breaks down yet again, it is dangerous for everybody, 
And this happens often in the coldest place on Earth. If it's that cold, the oil and the petrol can freeze. Everything working on fluids can freeze. Then I have to warm it up somehow. Otherwise, the bus won't start. The streets around Omyekon are in poor condition. Every pothole can become a trap out here. In the case of an engine breakdown, Grigori has 30 minutes until the temperature inside the car reaches the outside temperature of minus 50 degrees. The only bus driver far and wide is aware of his special responsibility. Carefully, he steers the bus around the largest holes. Out here, broken axles are not uncommon. At these temperatures, shock absorbers quickly freeze and become hard and stiff. But in Yakutia, a car is a newfangled phenomenon. The Siberians have always banked on their natural resources, which are independent of technology, which is sensitive to the cold. Reindeer. This deer species is an important part of life in Yakutia. On the one hand, reindeer are a fat-rich food. On the other hand, they serve as work animals, pulling the sleigh. And where there are no cars yet, they are also used as a riding animal. The domestication of the reindeer has helped the Omyakoni for centuries in the struggle against the icy cold. The reason for these extreme sub-zero temperatures lies in the unique geographical position of Yakutia. Mountain ranges close the little village off from the warm airstreams coming from the west and the south. On the other hand, the door to the Arctic is wide open. Icy streams of air press forward unhindered. So in Oymyakon, winter lasts from October until April. The all-time record low temperature minus 71 degrees Celsius, recorded in 2013 by the local meteorologist. During the summer months in June and July, on the other hand, it might even get as hot as 30 degrees. The villagers, however, take rather more pride in low temperature records. To go to school in these ice cold temperatures, is daily routine for the children in Oymyakon. It's high time for Sayana to get going. Sayana's siblings always join her. Her parents forbid her to walk this way alone. Their fear of her freezing to death on her way is too great. For us, this cold has become normal by now. I, too, had to go to school under these conditions. Sayana is still very young. But considering her age, she knows quite well how to deal with the cold. And the older ones help the younger ones. That reassures me a bit. Like nearly all children, Sayana goes marching to school. But it's not solely due to the cold. Under no circumstances may she miss the bus. It would, in fact, be better to be there a few minutes early, because the bus only comes once and does not wait. Without deigning to look at them, the three of them meet creatures which only exist here, above the Arctic Circle wild horses. With especially thick skin. They run free and can cope with temperatures down to minus 70 degrees.
Unlike the reindeer, horses are not work animals in Oymyakon, and it wouldn't occur to anyone to ride them. Horse meat is a delicacy here, and exercise would make the meat tough. By now, the bus has done more than half of its tour. Several children have been picked up, and it's three more kilometers to Sayana's home. But then, Grigori is in trouble. Something's wrong. One of the rear wheels won't turn anymore. That happens quite often, I'm afraid. These are old tires, they spin. This definitely wouldn't happen with new ones. If the bus gets stuck out here, there is a serious problem. Oymyakon is four kilometers away. Nobody will come to their aid. Grigori must fix the bus by himself. Otherwise, it may quickly become dangerous. Just last week, someone wanted to drive to the neighboring village, Tomtor. His fuel indicator was inaccurate. He hadn't checked it. His car ran out of fuel out here. Had he not got as far as here, he might have been able to walk back. Well, he died. Sayana isn't aware of any of this. With hurried steps, she trudges to the meeting point through the snow. Sayana doesn't know that the bus had a breakdown. She might have just as easily have missed it. The only thing she can do is hope and wait for the school bus at minus 52 degrees. I hope the bus is still coming or I won't be able to go to school. A few minutes, the eight-year-old can afford to wait in the cold. Then, she must quickly return home. Her destination, the school, is seven kilometers away, on the northern edge of the forest, the pride and joy of the town of 500 residents. Here, 25 teachers educate 118 students. The school principal, Katarina Yuvkovia, lives across the street. At a quarter to eight, she is the first to enter the building. This is the only school here. For the children living in this area, it is the only chance to receive an education. The school, with its 25 classrooms, is the largest building in Oymyakon. Therefore, it is also the most difficult to keep warm. We have central district heating here, which only heats this school and a few more private houses. A small coal-fired power plant heats six buildings via district heating round the clock with the help of 20 tons of brown coal per year. All the houses in Oymyakon are built of wood, like the school. Any other material, would burst with the differences in temperature of over 100 degrees between winter and summer. The structure of the houses is similar everywhere. An unheated outer room serves as a lock and storeroom. Then comes the heating room with the fireplace, followed by a room which is used as a living and dining room, and behind that lie the bedrooms. In order for the house to remain warm, the Omyakons fill up every gap, however small, with polyurethane foam. But the cold comes in at some point anyway, always. Alyosha's father has to heat the house nine months non-stop in order to keep it warm somehow.
My parents, my grandparents, and my great-great-grandparents have lived here. And so, we live here too. I like living in harmony with nature. In order to live in harmony with the extreme cold, one has to constantly be on the alert, even when performing very ordinary tasks. Irina cannot let the freshly washed laundry dry in the house. The risk is too great that the moisture will cause the beams of the house to split. At the coldest place on earth, the laundry always dries in the garden. Within seconds, the water is frozen and the laundry as stiff as a board. At least the wash is free of germs. The low temperatures immediately kill any germs. But Alyosha's father is also aware of the many disadvantages of the cold, especially when people get careless. Many people here drink, and it's happened often that they fall asleep in the snow. They don't notice that they're freezing to death. Already at temperatures around minus 20, the extremities start to die off. A few years ago, a friend of his froze to death in the middle of the village. One's worries become even greater if your eight-year-old happens to be a cheeky kid. In spite of the icy temperatures, he is full of nonsense, just as any other child his age would be. He especially likes to scare the cattle on their way to the water hole. He takes no notice of the special clothes the thick-skinned cows are wearing. As a shield against the cold, their owner has strapped a sort of special bra around their udders. A bra made of nylon stockings protects the most sensitive parts of their bodies from frostbite. Sayana has been waiting for more than 15 minutes already, but still no bus in sight. If it doesn't arrive soon, she will have to return home. Four hundred meters away, north of the clearing, Sayana's father performs his daily duties. The firewood doesn't have to dry after it's been chopped. Due to the icy cold, it has become so brittle, one blow is enough to break it. And Sayana's father needs a lot of wood. More than 60 cubic meters is burned by each inhabitant on average every winter. That adds up to five truckloads. We live here and work here. Without the work, one cannot survive. And whoever doesn't work, dies. Of course it's cold. Life can be tough here sometimes. But then you just have to work harder. Sometimes we work for sheer survival. What more can I say? If it's extremely cold, I simply cannot allow my children to run around outside. Then they have to stay inside, play computer games or watch TV. The only way they're allowed to walk is their way to school anyway. For Sayana's parents, moving away from Oymyakon is out of the question. They decided a long time ago to live in the coldest place on earth. But Sayana should make her own decision, and that is only possible if she goes to school and graduates. Like many other parents in Oymyakon, they put Grigori in charge of that.
as so often, the bus driver uses all available means to get his bus going again and to escape from the cold. Giving it a lot of gas and with a little bit of luck, he manages. But now it's shortly before eight o'clock. The breakdown cost him almost a quarter of an hour. It is quite possible that many children won't be waiting at the agreed meeting points anymore. But Sayana has held out. Just in time, Grigori picks up the freezing eight-year-old. The school bus. On the one hand, it's the only way to get to school. On the other, an unpopular necessity. The school bus is the worst thing. It's always loud, dirty, and too hot in there. Alyosha has been on his way for half an hour already. Even though he can make it to school in a good 20 minutes. But the lure to take the detour across the frozen river in the morning was too great. Now the nine-year-old is freezing. Within a short time, the bitter cold always finds its way through all six layers of clothes. The ice beneath Alyosha's feet is up to four meters thick in some places. In winter, cars and Grigori's school bus use the river as a shortcut. For the boy, the riverbed is always a place to discover new things. Because the Indigirka, that's what the Omyakans call the river, although frozen, is still alive. Four times a year, a truck from Yakutsk, which is 700 kilometers away, delivers canned and vacuum-packed food. Apart from this, the residents of Oymyakon live self-sufficiently. In every season of the year, the river provides staple food, such as fish. In wintertime, the river Indigirka is the hunting ground for ice anglers. Using their fishing rods and nets, they provide the basic food supply of the whole village. They wait for hours with their nets. Then they grab the fish out of the nets with their bare hands. The water, which is zero degrees, doesn't bother them. What does bother them, though, is the air temperature of minus 50 degrees. The ice fishermen don't have to kill the fish. Within seconds, the animals are shock frozen. The ice fishermen probably have the coldest job here in Oymyakon. That's not for Alyosha. One day, he wants to create something and see the world. I'd like nothing better than to become an architect, build houses.
That's why I attend school. Whenever he doesn't feel like going to school and taking on the icy way to get there, Alyosha remembers his dream. The last few meters, and he's made it. He is at school. Wearily and frozen stiff, he reaches the school building at a quarter past eight. Alyosha is a bit early, but there are already many children there. All those children who arrive on foot arrange enough time to thaw after their way to school. The best way is to play around. Alyosha's teacher prepares for her class. Half of the seats are still vacant, but in the coldest place on earth, nobody is able to skip class. If it's that cold outside, the parents may decide for themselves whether they send their children to school or not. But if the children don't turn up without informing the school and having an excuse, we must definitely call and ask what has happened. The risk of a child freezing to death on his or her way to school is too high. By now, the bus is full to bursting point. It's loud, stuffy, but at least it's not cold. After the more than two-hour drive, Grigori finally drives the crammed bus up to school. Sayana is happy to have arrived, and Grigori can take a break until school ends at 2 p.m. It's exactly half past eight. Sayana arrives in the nick of time with the school bell ringing. Today, all children are more or less punctual, and lessons start. Five hours lie ahead of the children. Math, biology, history, and Russian. Alyosha and Sayana are Yakuts. Their language is based on their Turkish and Mongolian roots. The Yakutian language has little to do with Russian, and so the children have to learn Russian almost as a foreign language at least if they want to leave this forbidden place at some point in time. Sayana stands a fair chance. She is a straight-A student and top of her class. Alyosha is talented, but not very hard-working. My favorite classes are history and math. But to be honest, I come here to play and paint and meet my friends. After the first two lessons, it's time for the main break. The students storm into the cafeteria. In cold Siberia, there is traditionally a second breakfast for the children. Warm noodles and hot tea, essential for the increased energy needs. Afterwards, they all stay in the building. No one wants to go out in the schoolyard. For this, the children would first of all need to put on various layers of clothing. That's too cumbersome, takes too long, and it's simply too damn cold outside. The 
play equipment in the yard is used only during three months of the year. However, they are designed in such a way that they can withstand even the coldest winter on Earth. If no one comes to the garden, the garden must go to the students. A few green plants provide for a little wellness oasis. Apart from that, the students pass the time playing board games. The school rifle is also very popular with the boys. The children learn how to disassemble a real gun and put it back together again. The quicker they learn how to do this, the earlier their fathers will take them hunting. Since the children can't really let off steam inside the building, there are gym exercises at the beginning of the third lesson. Sayana and Alyosha are in Russian class right now. This time the students were asked to learn a whole poem by heart. Sayana worked hard and knows all the verses perfectly. School ends at 2 p.m. While the children from nearby start off on their cold foot walk back home, the school bus children wait for Grigori and his ramshackle bus in the school building, where it's nice and warm. Often the students can hear him before they see him, quite simply because of the loud music. Afterwards, all of them just want to get into the warm bus. Alyosha enjoys the first part of the way walking with a friend. Then he's on his own again. Despite the extreme cold, his desire to move about is not in the least bit exhausted. Alyosha does what all children of the world do on their way home. He makes up his own games. Again, the eight-year-old dawdles on his way. But mom and dad know their son, and also know when they have to start worrying. Now he's fully warmed up. He won't be coming home that quickly now. <laughs> but he's well wrapped up. He wants to stay outside and play. But his games never last very long. <laughs> Nevertheless, Alyosha's father always feels a bit of relief when he sees his son come in through the garden gate. Sayana made it through the drive back with Grigori's school bus. 
Before doing her homework, she helps her mother in the kitchen. The two are very close, spend a lot of time together. No wonder, friends from school rarely come over to play at the farm, because they must take the bus and have to stay the night. Alyosha and his brothers turn the living room into a playground. The three of them have a great time together. Their favorite game is playing bus or car. I prefer summer. Then I could play outside longer. Sayana's siblings are too old to be playing with her. Most of the time she spends with her homework or coloring books. There's not much else to do for her in the coldest place on earth. At school there are many children. At home it is so boring. At school it's different. And my siblings are always just sitting in front of their computers. At 7 p.m., it's time for eight-year-old Alyosha to go to bed. The next day, the thermometer will decide whether he must get up early again, whether they will once again have to set out on one of the most dangerous ways to school on Earth. <laughs> 